we had a lot of people that we had a lot of people that wanted to join, um, but they couldn't today. So we decided we're going to record it for today. Correct. So just for the purpose of the recording, again, I'm Teresa Russ. I'm a captioner and a freelance reporter. And Regina, would you introduce yourself again? Yes, my name's Regina. I'm a CART and broadcast captioner. Good morning. Yeah, great. Thank you, everyone, for um, joining us. I think this is our third Coffee with Captioner, Regina. Is it our third one? Um, I, I thought it was our second, but maybe third. <laughs> maybe this is the third one. Okay, maybe this is the third one. Okay, so again, this event is being recorded. Um, this is an informal event, but just to sort of keep things a little organized and get everybody a chance to contribute um, that wants to, I'm going to ask you to use the raise your hand feature. And if you don't know where that's at, that's cool. You can just go like this. And then if um, if we missed you, don't take it personal. Just say, hey, jump in. Say, hey, uh, Teresa or Regina, I wanted to add something. I wanted to contribute something, okay? And uh, this is a two-hour event. Uh, around 255, 255, 10.55, we'll take maybe about a five-minute break. And also, I, I want to let you know to feel free to use the chat box uh, to connect with other attendees, you know, meet some new friends and get, you know, network. OK, so that'll be cool. Um, I have some announcements. I'll go rather quickly because we got a lot to do and a lot to talk about. So uh, the first announcement that I want to say is. Um, if you're not a member and you live in California, if you're not a member of CCRA, please join CCRA. We're stronger in numbers and your, uh, your board needs you, okay? And you can follow us on social media. Um, as a member, you'll get an online newsletter. And then the next thing I want to say, I hope you were able to see the video that's been circular around on social media. It's about the bylaws proposal. Um, if you have membership privileges, students can vote now, but as a member of CCRA, part of the membership, um, the board accepted the captioning committee's proposal to allow uh, certified captioners to be regular members as CSRs. And this is huge, you guys, because the captioning committee has been working on this for some time. So I wanna encourage you, if you go to the meeting, I mean, if you go to the convention, go to the business meeting and let your voice be heard by uh, voting yes to allow caption certified captioners to be regular board members. And what that will do is that real quickly, captioners will be eligible for any board position. Uh, committee membership and committee chair positions will be more available to captioners and captioners will feel, this is what we're hoping, you'll feel more welcome, included, desired, and appreciated by the association. So if you didn't get a chance to see that video, go to Facebook and you have to scroll down and you'll get more information. And I got two great announcements. Uh, this is big too that the CRB, the Core Reporters Board, a few, a couple of days ago, approved voice writers to take, or to be able to take the state exam like CSRs take and to be certified as Core Reporters. Now, let you know, it's not law yet, but the governor needs to sign off on it. So we want to welcome our voice writers and we do have a voice writer here now. So if you want to ask questions later on, her name is Lynn. And Another thing is the AB 156 bill, which is the title protection bill. You might have heard of it. Hey, I saw the chat. Um, this is with this enhanced language, this provision prohibits unlicensed persons from calling themselves reporters or digital reporters, um, thereby protecting the consumer from believing they have hired a licensed professional when they have not. So this protection is protection um, bill being approved is huge for us. You know, so these are the kind of things that your association is working on our behalf in our profession. And students mark your, mark your calendars for September 19th from seven to 8.15, um, support our students as having a virtual students night out. The first one they had was very successful. So you're invited to that. You can check social media or CCRA's website for more information. And also be sure to visit um, CCRA's website regularly. We're always adding new content, especially the captioning committee. We have a tab for captioning training. So if you wanna get more um, information about captioning, uh, 
find out how you get more training since right now the schools doesn't they don't offer a lot of training so we're trying to put it in one spot and there's one group on there called journeys uh Journeys in Mentoring. And I think yeah, Karen's here. Karen and Gina's here. Karen, can I ask you just real quick to tell us a little bit about uh, Journeys? Sure. Can you hear me? Yeah, there's that line. Can you Sorry, hear me? We're, we're, on a we're on a little road trip today. So I'm calling from my car. Sorry, to okay. sorry about that. That's okay. Um, yeah, so Journeys in Mentoring, uh, we've been <clears throat> started uh, the program back in June of 2021, and um, we just felt like there was a real gap between uh, getting out of school and going into CART or captioning and not really knowing what to do and how to go forward with, uh, with your careers other than, you know, court reporting, because, you know, as you know, all teach court reporting uh, throughout our programs. And so we thought, you know, this would be a good space for people together that need engagement, inspiration, a little coaching, training, mentoring, of course, uh, to get into the other wonderful uh, careers that uh, this uh, we offer, right? Captioning, broad captioning. Um, real time seminars, webinars, all those things. So we uh, have built a really nice program for people to come together and meet with four mem uh, mentors right now. We have actually a mentor in voice writing, uh, Lynn, she's here today, uh, Lynn Meyer. And we have Teresa, of course, has joined us. And um, we have Kimmy Pruitt, who is a cart cat, uh, court reporter who's transitioned into CART, who I mentored years ago. But um, anyway, so we have uh, mentoring available pretty much every day of the week. And we also have a collaborative meeting that we meet every week and we all get together. It's a real safe and inclusive space where we can talk about topics, how to do things, uh, uh, trainings. We also have special webinars that we put on with special guest speakers. Like, uh, for instance, we had a ergonomics uh, person come on and talk about how to work, you know, ergonomically correct in your home office and uh, what equipment is needed. And um, so things like that. And it's, it's just been such a a, a wonderful experience for me myself because I'm able to share all my experiences in cart caption for about eight. and um, Karen, it's just a, a great space and I encourage everyone to go. <laughs> Thank you, Karen, for sharing this with us. If you want more information, go to CCRA's website. You can find. Um, that information. Thank you, Karen. You were cutting in and out, but I think we got the gist of it. So thank you very much. Um, I just want to get a shout out that Katie is on here. She's a freelance reporter, so she's available to share her experiences. Um, Amy, are you here? Let me see if I see Amy. Okay, Amy, she's on the board. Uh, she's a a fisher. She she might join us later. And then we have Vanessa Stan. Good morning, Vanessa. Good morning. How are you? Very good. Thank you for being here. Vanessa has a lot of experience, so she's here to answer questions and share her experiences. And then we have April. Good morning, April. Good morning. Yeah, April has a lot of experience, so she's here to uh, with us. And then we have Lynn, who's a voice writer, as you know already. And um, so without, I'm going to stop talking. I'm going to turn it over to Regina, and we're going to do some housekeeping in the background. So you can start asking your questions. We'll be monitoring the chat box. And Gina, take it away. Excuse me, Regina, take it away. <laughs> oh, Gina, Regina, are you OK? I can't hear you, honey. Oh, there we go. I, okay. I'm, <laughs> that whole, like, I forgot I'm on mute, right? Can't, still can't get it after two years. Anyways, um, thank you guys for joining. Um, I, I specifically want to talk about um, the convention coming up. So we have the annual 
uh, CCRA convention. It, um, it is usually in October, but it got moved to um, the last weekend of September. Um, something really fun that we do at the convention is our paint and sip. Um, and it's a, an event where we have fun. We raise money um, for the captioning committee um, through CCRA. Um, and that month, those funds in that, um, those funds that we raise are used for people who um, can't afford to pay for captioning services. Um, we also pay um, the captioners that, let's say, um, who caption at the at the convention. We pay the captioners from that fund. Um, so all of a hundred percent of the of the funds raised through the patent sip through um, our walk for hearing. All of that goes towards um, captioners and um, our fund. So um, it's really for a good cause. And I found out this morning that we have 27 people registered and we only have 30 spots. So there's only three spots left, you guys, for the paint and sip. So if you are interested in joining, um, you can visit the website um, and um, register there. Also um, at the convention, I'm usually one of the speakers um, for the seminars. And this year, um, every year we have, you know, carts and we talk about, um, you know, usually 101 and, um, you know, all most of us on here already know what cart is, right? So, um, you know, really uh, captioners want more um, at the convention. And, and this year um, being a broadcast captioner, I really wanted something different. Um, so I worked with the convention committee and, um, and myself worked really hard to make it happen. We are having our first ever broadcast captioning session, um, that's dedicated only to broadcast. So, um, for those of you that are only in cards and you've never done broadcast before, I highly suggest and recommend that you come to the seminar. Um, even if you're not joining the convention, I'm happy to chat with you, um, you know, anytime about broadcasts, but, um, you know, it's, it's really, especially during the summer when you're working, um, and you find that the summers are slow, right? I don't know about you guys, but this summer was like more slow than usual, I thought. Um, so, you know, it's definitely to your advantage to do cart and broadcast because, um, you know, broadcast captioners have a little more to choose from during the summer, right? So, you know, a lot of people are intimidated by broadcast. It's so fast and, you know, the encoders and this and that, and that's what we're going to teach you in the seminar. Um, it's really, it's really not as intimidating as it sounds. Um, I was the same way and, um, I actually had someone when I was doing cart. um, I had someone, it was actually an agency owner, tell me that I would not be good enough to do broadcast. Um, and so, you know, I almost didn't go into that field. Um, and I'm so glad I did because it's, it's, it's not just television, it's all kinds of stuff. Um, and, and our, our seminar is actually, um, titled why it's more than just captions on your TV. So, um, it's really, it's really going to be awesome. I I'm so excited. Um, so hopefully you all will, will join us for that. Um, let's see. I, I don't know if Teresa wants to take back over or if you just want to jump into questions or, or what's going on, Teresa? Where'd she go? <laughs> there I am. There you go. Um, no, Regina, go ahead and do the questions. I'm typing the names in the wheel. Okay. Yeah. All right. So, um, so I mean, most of you, um, I, I see a lot of you are, are captioners already. Um, maybe actually, let's start with Lynn, um, who's a voice writer. Tell us about your journey. Um, voice writing is another aspect that a lot of people don't understand. They don't know about. Um, and one thing that I get often um, questions about, because I, I actually work with voice writers too. So um, one question or one um, comment that I get a lot is that voice writers use AI. So explain to us what you do, Lynn. 
Oh, I think you're on mute. Nope. What happened? Oh, there she is. Oh, I heard you now. I think it's working. <laughs> Never a dull moment, right? Can you get me now? Yes, we got you. <laughs> All right. My camera acts funny. I'm sorry. No um, worries. I'm Lynn Meyer. I'm in Massachusetts. I am a broadcast captioner. So nice to meet you, Regina. It's so hard yes. to find us. <laughs> it is. Yes. Um, I've been doing this for almost 15 years now. And uh, so I worked for one of the large captioning companies up until recently. And now I'm an independent contractor. And I've become a mentor with Journeys and Mentoring to help people like me who didn't have this when I was starting. And I was quite lost in the beginning. So I'm hoping that um, I'll be able to help people and also learn from all of you guys who are out there uh, yeah. that have been doing this for a while. So anything you need from me, you know, feel free to ask if there's anything specific. Uh, voice writers, we do not use AI. It's my voice. I repeat verbatim what's being said. I do mostly sports yes. and news Thank you. and I've just started doing some cart stuff. So there's a little transition going on there, but yeah, it's, there's no artificial intelligence when you're a voice writer, it's all us. So just like the steno, you know, you use your hands, we use our voice. So, um, so Lynn, Lynn, let's, let's just, um, just briefly kind of talk about how you do it because um, one of my friends that does um, voice writing, she explained to me that it's basically how on our machines, we use briefs, right? And so you guys use briefs too, right? So mm -hmm. if, if, you're, um, if you're saying, let's say um, Regina, right? You would say Reg or something, and then it would come out on the screen. Is that correct? I could say that. Yeah. If, if your name was difficult and I had an issue with it, I would shorten it or use um, just your initials. You know, we can, whatever you put in your dictionary, whatever you say can come out to whatever you want. So like for um, sports or television, when I need a speaker name, I say SPI1, SPI2 for however many people I need. Um, but you're adding that into your dictionary. You're using... Um you're using steno software, right? Like case cat or eclipse. I use eclipse, but it's a voice version. There's a specific version for voice. Okay. So we're, we have different, a little different settings and things to tweak in it, but basically the same. So if you're on eclipse or case catalyst, I've used both. Mm -hmm. But the, the software, um, because I've heard a lot of voice writers use um, Dragon, it's the, the, the voice writing um, software. But one thing that I've learned um, is that using Eclipse allows you to connect to like the encoders and all of the things that the, all of the broadcast software is that we use. Um, it allows you con to connect to that. So some um, I've heard of some voice writers only using Dragon, but that's not sufficient enough because you have to have that software in order to connect to um, TV stations or, you know, encoders and things like that. Correct. Yeah. Dragon runs in the background. That's um, where your all of your vocabulary is for the most part. Eclipse is where you get all the fancy stuff. You know, when you need to, to brief something out, that's what pushes it out. AccuCap is a different portion of the software that runs in the background, which allows you to connect to encoders, uh, stream text, iCap, OneCap app, all that kind of fun stuff. So that mm -hmm. piece you need if you want to do television. Right. Right. So, so maybe, um, you know, in a few sentences, um, because I know before I started working with um, with voice writers, I had no idea what you guys did. Um, you know, I was very oblivious. So I, I also was on that train of 
voice writers use AI and they're not our friends. They're going to take our jobs and, <laughs> you know, all of that. So in, in a few sentences, what would you tell, um, you know, steno writers and people who kind of are in that mindset that, um, that, that you're against us and you're going to take our jobs? No, we're not out to take your job. We, we're hoping someday everyone will see steno and voice as equal. Um, my train of thought is it's a different method of input, but we get the same output. If you put a voice writer and a steno side by side in a room and give them the same um, show to caption or classroom to caption, you're going to get the same output you know, and we all make errors. So you're gonna get a couple errors, whatever, but we're all good enough that no one would be able to tell who did yeah. the voice side and who did the steno side. There's, there's no difference really. We should all be friends. Right. Yes. And, 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 you know, working, um, I, I actually own my own cart agency and working with voice writers the last year. Um, that is absolutely true. I, um, I have clients that, that, actually request steno writers because they think voice writers are not going to be good enough um and you know i mean i i pick who's available i don't pick who's a voice writer who's a steno i just hey i have this job who's available um and so you know i i can definitely back lin up on that that um the captions you know it's definitely about your skill level and not about um what input you're using so yeah, so there's a question in the chat that says, how is your voice translated into text? Does Eclipse do that? Yes. Um, basically, whatever I say, um, whether it be just a regular word straight out of the dictionary or a custom word that I've um, put into my dictionary to come out as something different, it will all come out on the screen that you can read perfectly like you were reading a book. Um, for an example, you know, people say that we're not good enough because we can't distinguish between words. Well, you know, there's homonyms and 98% of the time between dragon and eclipse and context, it comes out correctly, but you always need something like between T-O versus T-O-O versus T-W-O versus the digit two. I say something different for each of those four words. So I'll say ta-ta for T-O. Twee twee for T O O, num two for T W O, and two Mac for the digit two. So when I know in context that I want it to come out and not get, you know, T O versus T O O or whatever, I want it correct. So I say something different. Um, if there's right. something really long, like supercalifragilisticexpialidocious, I say trans super. That whole thing comes out for me because I don't want to say however many syllables that is. I've never counted, right. but you know, stuff so, like that. So we, yeah, we control it. Yeah. And it's definitely like Steno where we have those briefs, yeah. you know, um, we have, you know, there, there, and there, and we have a different way to write all of those in Steno as well. So yeah, it's definitely, definitely similar. So thank you so much for sharing. There's an, there's one more question for you. Um, as someone says, would, you, would we be able to hear an example of what voice writing sounds like? Is that something you could, could do real quick? I could, if I could find something to read, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's see what I got around here. I don't have much to read. Let me pull something up maybe on. It, it is really intriguing. You know, like I said, I was definitely on that train where we had no idea what you do and um you know since working with them the last year um it's definitely opened up my my eyes so right. we value what you do for sure so i just pulled up the cnn website and just clicked on a story i don't know what it's about because i can't read that fast but um i'll read the first couple sentences of this story on how i would say it if i was hearing an anchor um, so if they were starting out with it, I would say New Mac, a city in New Mexico has about 20 days of fresh water left, comma, and officials there are scrambling to find another source to prevent cancer causing particles from flowing out of faucets, Pirk. The hillsides around Las Vegas, comma, New Mexico, comma, were scorched by the state posse, largest wildfire on record this spring, comma, 
which burned more than 340,000 acres, PIRC. And that's nice. how it would sound when it, the audio is coming into my headset. I would voice all of that out. So I have to know more or less when to put a comma in, whether it's a, a period or a question mark or an exclamation point. Sometimes you miss a comma because they're going so darn fast. Sometimes, you know, you drop a name or two, or if you, you know, darn well, you know, somebody's name is not um, typical. Um, you can work around that, say he or she, him or her. Um, right. Which is what we do in Steno. You know. So, yeah. you know, you kind of, you kind of got to wing it sometimes. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Definitely. Cool. Um, someone else asks, uh, let's see. Were you a steno writer before a voice writer? I went to school for steno. That's what I thought I wanted to do. So I got my associate's degree in stenography, um, but I did not pursue it. I stopped that, got my ma um, bachelor's degree in administrative management, worked in offices, and then started my voice writing course, which was for me only about nine months. Yeah. And, that's how I, and then I got into... Um, one of the captioning companies and worked for their worked for them for 13, 14 years. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and best to, to answer your question, like in a whole, um, a, a lot of people actually do start out in steno and then transition to voice, um, because they get, uh, uh, carpal tunnel in their wrists. And so they transition over, um, so it just depends on, you know, whether they went that route from the beginning or, um, or have gone, you know, chosen to go that route later. Um, Lynn, another question, how long is school for voice writers? Nowadays, um, I'm not positive. I would say a lot of things I've seen online or courses, they usually take about, um, you know, months at least a few months to get all the basics down. Um, like I only, like I said, mine was only about nine months, eight months, nine months, but I only went one day a week for eight hours a day. So I learned 80% of what I needed, um, during that time enough to get work and get a job. Um, and I'm still learning. I've, I've been taking classes from advantage or their webinars and learning from all of you guys. So it's a never ending you know, it's, we're always learning something new. So, yeah, but I, I don't know, I can't give you a definitive answer on the schools out there. And a lot of it sometimes is up to you. You might be able to finish quicker than someone else or slower. It's, it's kind of a self-paced thing. Um, so, you know, and you hit humps just like Steno do with their voice. You come to a plateau at a certain point, or you feel you can't speak fast enough. Cause you know, I've gotten upwards. I can speak 250 words a minute if I need to. It's not that pretty, but I can do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, it definitely is, um, you know, similar to to steno in that, you know, um, you know, we're trained at 200, you know, 200, 225. But I mean, if you do broadcast, we're hitting, you know, 300, 280. So you just got to do it, right? We're not we're not trained for that. But you just have to do it. So right. <laughs> um, yeah, someone that I work with actually um, has a, a, a voice writing school and um, she trains that and the schooling she tells me is about um, nine months to a year. So again, it's self-paced like steno. So it just really depends, you know, on how much you're putting into it. Um, yeah. And then, and then the last question before we switch over to a different topic is, um, the, the comment is I've seen a, a growing number of steno students switching over to voice. Is the output more accurate than steno? Um, that depends on the person. I mean, we're both, both steno and voice are accurate. Uh, some people are more accurate than others. So, you know, it's, it's what you put into it is what comes out of it. So the more you put into it and the better you get, you know, the better your output is. There are better voice writers than steno writers, and there are better, better steno writers than voice writers. So it depends on who you get. I mean, we're all we're all different, and we all have a different level. So, and even though I've been doing it for 15 years, I still get errors. You know, it's going to happen. So I can't say that I'm better than a steno, or a steno is better than me. It could depend on the topic. It, you know, it, you could have a bad day, and just you're just not feeling it, and the next day you nail it and knock it out of the park. So 
it's, it's ever changing. There's no definitive answer for that one for sure. <laughs> definitely, definitely. And, and just to reinforce that, um, so I did a job the other day where it was an award ceremony and they gave me zero prep and they were literally reading hundreds of names. And I, I, you know, am texting my client in the middle of all this. And I'm like, you have to send me something. I'm literally finger spelling every single one of these names. Like you're killing me smalls, you know, like, <laughs> like send me something. Um, and I had my, my voice writer, um, partner that, you know, I said, I said, can you hop on and relieve me for a little bit? My, you know, my arms are going numb. Um, and you know, it was, it was actually more difficult for her to do it than for me because, you know, we, we can finger spell, but for voice writers, it wasn't that easy to like, I don't know how you even say it, voice spell um, every name. Um, so it, it actually came out cleaner when I did it. Um, but, but the, the thing that I really want to reinforce here is that you know, it's not about whether you have a CSR, it's not about whether you have a captioning certification, it's about how much you put into that skill level, right? So whether your voice, whether you're, you know, um, Stena, whether you're a depot reporter or a captioner, no matter what it is that you are doing and your, your um, niche in this field, take the time to hone in your skill and make your skill the best that it can be because you can have, you know, that CSR and not have good real time. You can have, you know, your captioning certification and you can't caption to save your life. So, you know, you definitely, it, for me, um, it's, it's never really been about the certification. It's always been about your skill level. And I guarantee you that if you make your skill better, um, the companies that you work for are going to notice that and they're going to put you on the better jobs and they're going to, you know, like in a deposition, they're going to give you the real time jobs in, um, you know, in court, you're going to get the, the judges that want the real time. So it, it's, it's always better in no matter what field you're in. Um, it's always better to hone in on your skill level and, and make it better. So, um, so thank you, Lynn, for explaining what you do. Um, that was amazing. That was awesome. So You're very um, welcome. Teresa, I will hand it back over to you. Okay. Thank you, Regina. You're so awesome. I like if you I like to go to some of the questions that people have um, had asked about. Uh, for example, for you veteran uh, captioners, can you share some tips and tricks for real time? Um, like Regina gave an example on a job where she didn't get any prep material. And so she had to use her basically common sense and got in contact with the consumer, you know, so you're going to face challenges on the job and you have to think quickly on your feet. And I, some of that is common sense. I remember having a job where it was a photography class and we had to go into the dark, uh, what do you call the dark room? And when the professor saw us, he said, oh no, you can't bring that equipment in here with you. And so my team member who had, was uh, more advanced than me, she quickly thought, and we changed the colors and stuff on our monitor and we made everything kind of dark. And then we were able to not only, number one, keep our job for that day. And number two, you know, still be able to perform and um, help our consumer out. So anybody want to share anything that you, um, any tricks that you do in real time or just how you get out of awkward situations? Okay, I'm going to pick on April. I'm glad she, she uh, held her hand up. <laughs> Hey everyone. I love you, Regina, for how hard you work and just everything that you do. And thanks for sharing what you, your situation, because I feel we learn from each other and um, I love you for that. So anyway, I think I would have personally done what Regina did, or I'm going to be really honest, because that's what we're doing here is I might have, unless I was asked uh, not to do that, start off maybe with a parenthetical and just said reading names. Um, it, that depends on your uh, consumer. It depends on your client. 
Um, but I have started meetings uh, from the beginning and it's worked out, say, when they take roll call. Um, I've started with parentheticals, um, roll call or roll call vote. And it has worked for me and, and my clients and consumers um, because if I need someone who needs to jump in and they don't, they're not as familiar with this because, right, that happens. Regina has bailed me out on more than one occasion and her uh, people that work with her. Um, it's nice because then it's not a hot mess, but that's just with my client it might be different with everyone. Um, just a simple parenthetical and reading names or whatever it is. That's just one option. Thank you, April. Um, I agree, April. Okay. Oh yeah, Vanessa, uh, you want to give us some tips and tricks on what you do on the job in real time, all that good stuff? Hello, <laughs> thank you for having me here. Um, thank you for coming. So I think the most important thing that I've learned writing real time is you have to be extremely flexible <laughs> and really just kind of roll with the situation because things can change really, really fast. And so sometimes there just isn't a way to just be fully prepared for what you think you're going into, even if you think that you're completely prepared, if that makes sense. So I've done it both ways, how um, Regina was mentioning, just finger spelling everything. And then I've done things April's way too, where you just put up a, ther a parenthetical because sometimes you have no way of knowing how to um, spell names correctly. And, um, and that can be bad in my opinion. So it just depends on the situation, I guess. <laughs> Yeah, and, and in, in my situation, um, you know, when I was texting the client, I'm telling them, look, these are hard names. Like, there's no way I'm getting half of these names spelled correctly. And he literally texted me back and said, it's okay, don't worry about it. Just do the best you can. Um, and so in my case, it wasn't, it, it, there was no way that I was, I was, I could put up a parenthetical. They wanted the names captioned because it was an award show. Um, and so I, you know, it, it's like, it's like a, like a catch 22, right? You want to caption things, but then they don't give you nothing. <laughs> they don't give you prep. So you're spelling them wrong. And then they're like, well, why are these names spelled wrong? Well, hello, you didn't give me the names. So yeah, you just, um, you just got to roll with it and do the best you can. Uh, let's see, we got, let's look and see what's in the chat box. Oh, I got to be There it goes. Um, do you guys use some type of steno trick for common names like Lopez, L-O-P-Z, things like that you can share? That question's up for grabs. Well, I do. Um, I try to, you know, like when you learn in school how to just do it double, like Teresa Russ, Russ Russ, or something like that. Like say if Russ was a difficult name, Russ Russ. But I, you know, with real time, you get one stroke wrong, the whole word is ruined. So um, I don't like to do that. But sometimes if I get a name and I get prep material, and I get a name that there's no way I could pronounce that name. Like there was a gentleman with the um, Armenian and it was like 26 letters in the name and I just used the first syllable and I did do the double stroke method so when his name came up you know I was just very careful when I went uh, like bar bar you know and, and it looked so beautiful coming out that you know because I didn't have to try to I couldn't I didn't I don't need I couldn't even begin to pronounce the name so that's something that I do anybody else what about you uh, April Regina Vanessa anybody else so, so for me, I, you know, my school, um, they had briefs, but they weren't super heavy on briefs. Um, and the thing that I've learned over my years, um, my 16, 17 years in this industry is I'm faster when I don't have briefs um, because you don't have, you don't have that mental capacity trying to remember all the briefs you made. So for me, um, it's weird. And I don't know if anyone else does this, but if I'm captioning a broadcast, um, you know, like a, a news show, for example, and they're speaking 280 words a minute, I am 
more clean in my writing than I am if I'm doing a 180, you know, word per minute class because I have more time to think, right? If they, you know, they're like, oh, we, uh, you know, Zimbabwe and this and that. I'm like, oh, what's my brief for that? You know, and I'm like, I, I have more time to think about it versus if I'm writing 180 words or sorry, 280 words a minute, um, I just write Zimbabwe at, you know, Zimbabwe. Like I just flow with it. And so I, I've always found that I'm faster, um, the fewer briefs that I have. You know, Regina, I'm glad you brought that up because when I was in school, we didn't get a, uh, where the first school I went to, they didn't give us a lot of briefs. They didn't encourage that because if you hesitate, then you, you know, you've lost some information. So, um, but I just recently started incorporating briefs a little more than I used to. But I like here, Vanessa says, same for me, Regina, I don't use a lot of briefs. So it depends on, you know, you. Uh, go ahead, April. You know what? I have to tell you, I'm, I'm dinosaur in this profession. I started off as a court reporter for several years and I wrote everything out. And I was like, yeah, that's just the way it is. I mean, I write everything out. My brain can't keep up with the um, briefs until... Um, not this summer, but the summer before our NCRA convention. Um, and um, I went to all the captioning, all of the uh, breakout sessions with captioning. And I just love that they were like, well, that's great until your hands start really hurting. And I've been doing this a long time. I thought, I got a long ways to go before I can retire. And I had to retrain myself. And it was cool because I never thought of like, I don't know, like April Chandler, AC, I, you know, um, and I, I kind of have fun with it. I'm a, I'm a slow learner. I have little sticky notes everywhere. But even though um, I tend to write things out, I have found that now it's a little game, especially if I'm in, a, say, a class that I'm very comfortable with. Um, or even the hard job after a couple hours, you know, I'm like, okay, how could I do that, you know, differently? So I just encourage um, a lot of us that write things out. And this is from my friends at NCRA. April, your hands can only do so much because there are five letter or syllable, you know, um, and obviously it's not possible, but in the moment you do what you can do, but protect yourself, protect your hands, get the right chairs, you know, use briefs if you're not used to it. Um, and a lot of the softwares I'm on case and it has a little program where it gives you suggestions. And that typically is the first letter you know, of each word or syllable rather, and then put a little asterisk in it. Anyway, that's just kind of what I'm learning. I, I started in 1991 and I'm a little embarrassed to say that because I know it makes me sound really old, but um, I did. And so I, we didn't even have a, um, I'm embarrassed, but we didn't have a theory that was um, compatible. My, my Donna, my teacher said, you'll know when you see it, you'll know when you hear it. And then you got to go back and hit one, two or three when you have all those, um, what do we call uh, Regina, the um, conflicts. So obviously yeah. you have to be conflict free to be a captioner. Um, there's no room for that in captioning, but you know, I've learned, I've evolved. And I think that's where we all are, but protect your hands, do what you can. That's just my suggestion that someone gave to me at the courthouse years ago, get your massages, um, protect yourself. This is a profession that we can have for a lot of years if we take care of our body, mind and soul. Thank you, April. That was good information. Uh, Vanessa, it looks like you have your hand up. Yes. While we were on the subject of briefs, I wanted to um, I wanted to kind of share my story because I never used briefs in school. Um, I had some for like jury charge, but it was like very minimal. And um, a lot of the instructors were like, you're never going to get to 225 words per minute because you're writing everything out. And when people tell me I can't do something, I really like to like do it to prove them wrong. <laughs> like it makes me really stubborn and I'm like, okay, well watch, you know? <laughs> and so I made it, I made it through school without using any briefs. And what was interesting is there was, um, I had a classmate and her and I were kind of like, we progressed at the exact same pace throughout school, which was interesting because she was brief heavy. She used briefs for everything and she used brief phrases and all all that stuff and I wrote everything out and for her and I we still progressed the same I'm not saying that that's typical but it was just very interesting I ended up graduating before her which was kind of fun because I didn't use any briefs and so I just I think it's important for 
um, students and uh, new reporters to know that it's really important to do what works for you best. Some people are so good at using briefs and brief phrases. And then people like me, just, I can't remember them. It takes me more time to remember the brief than just to write it out in five strokes, maybe, as awful as that sounds. Because um, when you're captioning, you can't have that hesitation. Um, you'll, you'll miss too many words. You're going to miss too much of the content. And so I just want to stress, it's so important to do what works for you. And there's no right or wrong way as long as you do it and you rock at it. So uh, I like that. That's all. Thank you. Oh, Vanessa, thank you. That was good because um, I don't uh, do phrases well. I, I, in school, when I was trying to do it, I just gave up on it. I don't do phrases as well. But uh, I like what uh, Karen said that, what did you say, Karen? She does the double stroke briefs because oftentimes she's I'm prepping at the last minute and easier to remember. So like Vanessa said, you know, what works for you. Uh, two participants raised hand. Okay, Vanessa, I got you. And let me see who else got their hand up. Anybody else? Lynn. Oh, Lynn, where are you? I don't even, I'm here. <laughs> Go ahead. I'm just going to expound for voice on, on your brief uh, discussion here. I call them custom words. Um, and there's a couple different ways I do things. I have what I call a tran list. So like tran one, if, especially in the news, when they tend to say certain things over and over, and sometimes I just use them as a one-off for the week because that story is hot for the week. Um, but or a name I can't pronounce. Like when they started saying um, all that Ukrainian stuff with President Zelensky, I was ha like, that just tongue tied me. So I'd put him in Tran one or whatever slot I had available. Um, when I was doing stuff for like the past presidential election, you know, vice president elect uh, Kamala Harris. So that was VPEKH. Like I just did initials because I don't want to say all that. Um, the Derek Chauvin guy, former Minneapolis police officer that that became Ploffer because I just, you know, there was a lot to say every 18 seconds because they kept saying it, you know, throughout the news story, former Minneapolis police officer. That's a mouthful. So I just came up with something real quick on the fly, uh, put it in my dictionary and then went from there. And, you know, once that story died down a little bit, you don't have to use it or you can change it up and use that for something else that's now current in the news. So you can, you know, like recycle a custom word for something else. It doesn't have to stick, stay that way for eternity, but yeah. it helps. <laughs> And, and when I was saying, you know, write everything out, I wasn't saying never use briefs, right? Because, um, you know, you want to use briefs, especially if like you're doing broadcast and you're doing the same newscast every single day, you obviously want to brief things like the anchor names and, you know, they, they ramble off the city names, you know, oh, in San Bernardino, it's, you know, 60 degrees today in Riverside and, you know, LA, blah, blah. You want to have those those briefs for the things that you're captioning constantly. Um, so yeah, it's not that we don't use any briefs. It's just that, you know, if you have like a particular name um, or something um, for me, it's going to be in a job dictionary, unless it's something that I know is going to pop up on, you know, like it, like, like a world event that's happening in the whole world, um, you know, like a, like a president name or something like, um, you know, she was mentioning, um, you know, Derek Chauvin, or um, like for me, it was um, the Boston Marathon. That was my, you know, big one that I captioned, um, you know, the, the bombers names, like things like that. That's something in the news where you want to have that brief in the moment, but, you know, it kind of dies down after a, a while. So you're not necessarily going to use that forever. Um, there was one question I wanted to, to answer really quick. Um, I know you're a super fast finger speller, but do any of you ever find yourself dropping any words after the word you've just spelled? Um, so for me, I, it's that point where if they're, you know, if they're captioning very, or if they're talking very fast and I'm having, I'm struggling to keep up and I got a finger spell. Um, that's the point where you paraphrase, right? You, you do what you can in the moment to help um, yourself keep up. If, um, you know, if, if it's literally just too fast for you, you got to just dash and keep going. Um, there's nothing, you know, nothing else you can do in the moment, but um, definitely that's where paraphrasing helps us in this industry. Um, 
obviously, you know, court reporters in, in court and depots, they have the ability to stop them and say, repeat yourself. Um, but in captioning, we don't have that option. So um, you literally just have to figure it out in, <laughs> in one second. You got to put it all through your brain. What am I doing? What am I doing? And then boom, out your fingers and make it happen. So um, yeah, um, let's see here. Oh, Regina, can I jump in? I want to yeah. ask, let's pick Katie's brain. She's a, a freelance reporter. Uh, Katie, what, um, how do you handle um, you know, your briefing? Uh, do you do real time? Unmute yourself. Katie, you're on mute. Hi. Um, I don't as much anymore. Um, I'm an old reporter also. Um, and I have gone to doing one job a week. <laughs> I, I, it, it, I love it still, but um, I just, I'm one of those that have been back to school three times. So I should be the quickest, fastest now. Um, <laughs> uh, most, uh, a lot of you know, I, I, I can hold my hand up. Difficult to see, but do you see how my pinky does not straighten up? I have actually cut it off and they slapped it back on, but it does not move or bend like it used to. So I had gone back to school for that when I cut my finger off. What else did I go? You know, I, I, I went blind. I've done a lot of things where I've actually had to go back to school and start all, you know, like at 80 or 100 words a minute and progress myself up. Did not take a long time, but still. Um, for briefing, I like briefs. Um, when I was in school, the first, a lot of them, I, you know, yeah, I went to Bryan also. And so they did not encourage us to do a lot of briefing. So I did not do a lot of briefing, but I think my first one was like something like misdemeanor, some, you know, and I was like, okay. And so I would look up if there was a brief and I would try to incorporate them. Um, for me, I am dyslexic. So I also have a learning dis disability. Um, I would put them on a sticky, put them on my laptop, I mean, on my uh, machine, and I would work them for maybe, you know, two weeks. I would have five briefs on my machine, and I would work those same five briefs within my uh, lessons we got or whatever for two weeks. If it did not stick after that two weeks of going to school, practicing, working with it, editing, I was like, okay, I'd drop it. And I would just, you know, pick up five more. But a year later, now this is just how my brain works because I'm dyslexic. A year later, you know, that brief, that I'll have a, something in that brief and I would put it on my machine again for the two weeks and it would stick right away. So, it, it, you know, my brain is a little, you know, crazy. And so I just have to kind of work with it when it wants to work. So I do use a lot of briefs now, but that's after 20 years of working. And, you know, and I actually do keep a brief book where I, I write down my briefs. And yeah, I have, you know, I have a depot book uh, because I'm in depots. And so at the end of a job, I actually kind of go through that job and I write down things that I could have briefed or do I want to use that brief? So Briefs are, you know, iffy as far as do you want to use the brief or do you not? And they come to you at different times and, you know, um, I don't know what, <laughs> my hand, I do a lot of, I have a lot of garbage in my writer now. And I was told to kind of put it in because my finger that, you know, it drags sometimes in my writing. So instead of putting in, um, I don't know, um, it'll come out top and or it'll come out stop and what I really need is the word top because that baby finger has drugged that s so I have a lot of you know issues but because I've been writing for a long time I have those issues within my dictionary and therefore it comes out correctly I used to do um real time but once I went back to school one of those times I decided that you know I could I could do this profession without doing real job. And now, like I say, I'm down to like one job a week. And that's perfect, you know, 
uh, with Social Security and whatever else, I'm good. I still love court reporting. Um, I, might I have one mentor on. Her name is Carla, and she's on. I also have another young lady that, you know, I met her in a parking lot in that big one up in uh, Santa Monica. There are two parking lots that run underground. Lord have mercy. How many times can you lose your car? <laughs> I need to tell you. I was like, okay. And I met this parking attendant, and, you know, I was telling her about court reporting. And lo and behold, I guess a month later, she called me, and she was in court reporting school. And she's now at one about 150. And we that still talk. And I still take her. We go out to lunch every now and then. And you know what? I, we just keep it moving. So I need to get in on that Miss Karen's mentoring thing. And we're trying. I've been talking and we just cannot seem to uh, get it hooked up. But I do have two students that I mentor. I love court reporting. I think it's just a great, great thing. And it's fun. You know, to me, to me, it's fun. Um, when people ask me, well, what do you do for fun? I'm like, my jobs. You know, and people look at me like, okay, this is where I sit. But, you know, I love court reporting. I think it's just so much fun. I, I can stay on it. Whenever I don't have anything to do, I go do my jobs. Or I go practice my briefs. Or me and when and weather. Those two words, for some reason, I have, all, we all have those things that, you know, Five years later, you're still at those things. So I have those written down, things that I need to practice like that. So uh, my fun thing is to um, better my court reporting. <laughs> nice. And, uh, I wish you could see all the comments. I hear, wow, so very cool. We would, uh, Katie's gonna join with um, Journeys and Mentoring. And uh, Karen said, you'll help so many. And then Ruby said, you're awesome. <laughs> So I think this would be a good time if you like maybe to take a five minute break. Um, then when we come back, we'll do the raffle, Regina. Yeah, sounds fun. Okay. So it is, uh, well, 10.58. Well, let's just say I'll come back at 11.05. Uh, 11 yeah, so yeah. So go grab some just coffee. A, just a quick potty and, and coffee break. Everyone, we're gonna take a, our, group, our group photo. So make sure you grab that cup of coffee so we can flash it up. And we'll do that in our raffle after the break. Sounds good. Okay, we come back, uh, everyone, at what, 11.05? Yep. Okay, good.
All right, all right, all right. <laughs> <laughs> what, what, what's the, the guy that says that? I forgot his name. I don't know. Matthew McConaughey. Yes, Matthew McConaughey. Yes. All right, all right, all right. Love it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you guys. So um, just quickly, we want to, um, we're going to move into another topic. Um, but before that, we, we well, actually, we're going to do our raffle too. But, um, but I, I just want to go over the convention schedule. It's super important, you guys. Um, I'm going to put the link in the chat for the schedule. Um, you know, follow along if you'd like, but I just kind of want to point out a few sessions, right? So the, set, the uh, convention this year is September 23rd, 24th, and 25th. Um, so the first event that will be on Friday is the paint and sip. So already have, you know, we're going to have fun right off the bat. Um, and back to, let's go back to the chat. Ruby, I'm sorry, I missed your question earlier. Are broadcast captioners typically employees? Um, so it, we're both. There are companies that hire both um, employees and um, independent. So it really depends on what kind of lifestyle you want. Um, if you are someone that is single and you need the, um, you know, the health insurance and, you know, the benefits, things like that, then being an employee would be more beneficial for you. Um, for someone who, let's say, has a spouse that has all that and you don't really need any of that, you just want to work and, and um, you know, and make your money, then um, an independent contractor would be better. Um, Vanessa says she's done both and she prefers being an independent. And yes, same. I, I've definitely done both and independent for me is, is amazing. You get to pick and choose your schedule, um, you know, things. So it just, it just depends if you need that, um, that health insurance, then, you know, the employee route might be better. Um, we can definitely talk about that Ruby. Um, if you, uh, if you want to chat after this, we can, we can talk about that. Um, so back to the schedule. Um, so the paint and sip first event, you guys, usually we have it like in the middle of this, of the convention. Um, this one start off the convention, right? Having fun. Um, then my broadcast seminar will be, um, after that at, uh, one of the concurrent breakout sessions at two. Um, there are the, uh, there's a student, um, there's always the student seminar, um, student to certified. So kind of that, um, you know, that bridge in between, um, let's see, what was the other one I wanted to point out on Saturday? Um, the, so there's code of ethics 101. So don't, don't be um, intimidated by the 101 thing. It's really, it still is 101, but we're not talking about um, the actual 101 of CART. We're talking about um, ethics and industry standards. So this will be a good one um, to, you know, there, there's a lot of situations um, that, that always come up in this industry where, you know, just little things like, like for example, a captioner takes a, takes a class um, for let's say a lower rate. And then they find another class that pays a higher rate. And they, they tell that first company, um, Hey, I'm no longer going to take this one. Um, sorry, I'm not available. And then they go take the other one that pays higher. That's, you know, that's an ethical situation, right? I mean, this community is very small and agencies talk among, among one another. So if they know, um, you know, that you're, you're ditching one of their classes to take something that, that pays more. Um, I mean, one that makes yourself look bad and, um, you know, and it, it and your name's probably going to get out there as someone who's not reliable in the industry. Um, so, you know, ethics is a, is a huge important part in this industry as well. And a lot of people, um, you know, don't, um, there, there's nowhere that really teaches that part of this industry, right? So we really want to focus on that. April and Teresa um, are two that will be presenting that seminar. So that is um, a huge, important one. Um, the um, As Teresa talked about the bylaws in the beginning, um, so our business meeting that's going to be on Saturday um, midday, um, the luncheon, that um, will be the time where we're going to vote on the bylaws. So um, your 
participation and vote in that is important because if we don't get enough votes, then we will not be equal to um, our reporter friends. So definitely, definitely need you on that one. Um, there was one other one. Let's see, one other one I wanted to point out. Um, I can't find it now. Anyways, there's lots of lots of good stuff. Um, the there's always uh, Nick from Stream Text always uh, does a session on um, the platforms, and um, so that's you know if there's a platform that you don't know, like iCap, OneCap app, um, things like that, you know, definitely reach out to one of us um, to learn those, you know, because there's always jobs that come up, um, you know, and you don't, you don't want to say, oh, no, I'm sorry, I'm available, but I, I, I can't take it because I don't know how to use that platform, right? So you definitely want to make sure that, um, that you learn all the platforms. Um, Ruby, how does pay work as a broadcast captioner in court reporting? It's by page and then extra for expedites. So um, usually in broadcast, it's per hour. So even if you're an employee or an independent, um, we get paid per hour. Um, so it just depends, the rate depends on what agency you're working for. As an employee, you're gonna get paid less because you are getting benefits, you know, the health insurance and things like that. So majority of the time, the employee captioners um, make less per hour um, just because you have those extra benefits. Um, but again, you know, that's why a lot of people choose the independent route because for me, I just want all my money. <laughs> so I tend to, um, you know, I just, just give me all my money and I'll do with it what I want, you know, so you gotta, you gotta pay your own taxes and, you know, things like that. But, um, definitely, you know, it just depends on your lifestyle and what fits you, um, fits you best. So the range per hour, um, yeah, it's, it's so, it's a tricky situation. Um, I will give like a very broad range on this, um, but I'm happy to chat with you, you know, offline. Um, but usually the, the range is like 60 to 90 per hour um, in, you know, in the industry. Broadcast captioners are usually like 35 to 55 ish, and that's very low. Um, broadcast captioning has definitely gone down. Um, that's why a lot of people choose to go the cart route because it pays more. Um, but like I said, you know, it's, it's best to be in both. You don't want your, all your eggs in one basket, you know? Um, so in the beginning, um, or, or not in the beginning, but in the summers, when it's slow, you have more to choose from. You want to get on with as many agencies as possible um, and, you know, be able to um, pick up something, you know, and, and that goes back to the ethics, right? If you, if you show that you're reliable, companies are going to email you for work um, and say, hey, we have this, can you pick it up during the slow times versus, you know, I have captioners that I don't talk to them all year long and then summer hits and they're like, hey, do you have work? Um, no, I'm going to give it to my captioners that have been with me all year long. Um, you know, so yeah, it just, you know, it, ethics definitely plays, um, plays a big, a big role in this, um, industry as well. So anyways, I'll stop there. Teresa, go ahead and do the, um, the raffle and then we can move on to our next topic. Okay, Regina, I will do that. But, uh, Valerie had a question. Can you work at the courthouse and be working as a cart captioner? yes so so the, they would do the raffle yeah usually um usually the courthouses um don't hire people um in-house they they go through an agency um but that's actually one of my favorite jobs is doing cart in court because you get best of both worlds um you're in court you know i always wanted to be an official so you're in court getting that court vibe but you're there for a deaf consumer, right? And you're so you're you're providing the captions um, and helping someone with a disability. So it's definitely best of both worlds. Um, it just depends, you know. That's why you got to get in with a lot of different agencies. It depends on the agencies that have those contracts. Um, but yeah, you definitely can do that, and um, it's it's awesome. That's one of my favorites for sure. Uh 
April, let, let's take April's question, then we'll go to the raffle because I don't want to forget what she <laughs> wanted to share. Go ahead, April. Because <laughs> I could just forget. I would. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, me too, um, Teresa. I was just going to piggyback on Regina about the Code of Ethics 101 breakout session. We're going to be um, really uh, hitting on Code of Ethics with our consumers, uh, what to say, what not to say, uh, do's and don'ts, if you will. So many of a lot of my former friends and colleagues from the courthouse are amazing writers, but we enter this different arena where our, our clients, or as we call them, the people that we provide our captioning for our consumers, clients pay the bills. Um, we invoice the clients, we caption with our consumers or for our consumers. But just to kind of go into things when you enter that profession or our profession, things that we might not know, we might be great writers, but it's not good to engage, say, with a professor and not captioning what we're saying. Just things that really would be nice to know when you enter this profession versus like a lot of us learning the hard way. So we're going to hit on some of those topics if you can uh, come and pay a visit and uh, join us for that session. Excellent. April. Um, April, before we leave today, I really want you to share when you captioned in Switzerland, was it, or Australia? Say it again. Russia. Was, oh, Russia, in, okay. So it was remind in the me. 90s before some were born. <laughs> Let's put it that way, or we wouldn't have done it in live sessions. So. Yeah, some of you have really done some exciting things. Okay, let's give some stuff away. Uh, okay, what we have is one $25 Amazon gift card, and then two gift cards that have mu um, multiple um, you want to, companies like, um, you know, restaurants, shop, um, a store in the mall, things like that. It has a lot of other uh, vendors. So we're going to start the raffle, and here we go. Oh, by the way, um, if you're a winner, you want to put your name, send, you, send your email address to me, and we'll get that card out to you. Ready? Everybody good? Give me a thumbs up. All right. Vanessa! <laughs> I never Woo! win anything. <laughs> Vanessa, I have your email. But you can send it to thank me. Thank you anyway. so much. You're oh, very yeah, welcome. I can... Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Oops, I got to drop. Oops. Uh, this is not um, a valid one. I need... Oh, can I still do it? Yeah, you can do it. Okay, but cool. Our hunter... Congratulations, both of you. So excited. Thank you. Hey, you're welcome. Um, we, we're doing um, three. Three. Okay. When I learn how to count, I'll be good, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Shant Kelly. Oh, sorry, Shante. Kelly. <laughs> you almost made it, Shante. <laughs> Very good. Congratulations to our winners. Yay. Uh, just go ahead and put your, uh, send your email address to me, okay? And we'll go from there. And and Teresa, before we move on, let's do our group photo before we, oh, yeah. before we forget. Okay. Um, so everyone just hold up your, come on camera with us and hold up your coffee. And we're going to do our beautiful, um, our beautiful photo here. Hold on, let me go out. Okay. All right. Everyone ready? Are you going to do two, Regina? Because on my, I, you know, you have to scroll across because there's some more on the other side. Oh, yeah. There is. Yeah, I'll do both. Okay. I'll do both. So give me a second here. All right. Let's see. I'm doing a screen share, a screen uh, snippet, snipping thing. So let's see if I could get it. All right. All right. Everyone, cheese. Cheese. <laughs> okay. Let me try another one. Hold on here. Documents. <laughs> Hold on, you guys. Bear with me. Okay. All right. Let me take a let me take a picture on my phone just in case that one didn't come out good. 
Ay, ay, ay. All right. You're welcome, Kelly. All right, you guys. Let's see if you I can do it. this without dropping anything. All right, everyone. Cheese. Captioning. <laughs> Okay, and then let me go move to the next side because I miss people. Okay, one more for the people I didn't get. Yay, all right. Absolutely Thank rocks. Thank you so much. Thank you, Regina. Wonderful. I love to see all your faces. Me too, There's I'm so excited. <laughs> so many people I have not seen in so long. And I just truly hope that um, a lot of you will join us in, in September for the convention. I just, you know, networking, like I was saying that ethics is a huge part. Networking is even bigger in this industry, um, you know, to, to talk and just meet people and, you know, ask people, hey, you know, can you give me referrals and, and just, you know, just have fun together. Like we're such a small community and just to, to, to be one and just love each other and just have fun together. And, you know, it's just, it's awesome. So thank you. Thank you guys. Okay. Uh, we're going to switch up a little bit to something a little bit more serious and not as fun. Um, because Karen from Journeys and Mentoring, we were chit-chatting and Lynn at our last meeting. And Gina, as a matter of fact, Karen and Gina are a mother and daughter team, by the way, which is really Ooh. awesome. Yeah. We got to get them to talk about what they do. Um, Bye, Felicia. Thank you for joining us. Have a great weekend. Felicia's a, Felicia is an awesome captioner, by the way. She works for UCLA. Woo. Uh, we love you, Karen. Okay. So um, what was I saying? Oh, taxes. You know, that's something that's not covered in school. And many of us have to learn it the hard way. I know I did. A little jokey joke. Um, I know when we first started doing taxes, my husband does ours. And then he asked me about, you know, had I been putting money away for taxes and all that stuff. And I told him, I said, no. I said, I was going to do it, but I just haven't done it yet. So then he said, well, Teresa, you can't be making all that money and keeping it to yourself. <laughs> and I thought, well, why not? I made it. It's mine. But I did know a little bit. I'm being kind of silly, but I did know a little bit, but I just was careless. And so anyway, long story short, uh, I did consult a CPA person and he told me to take out 10% of my earnings because, you know, when we do our taxes, then the money will be there. So anyway, um, to you veteran reporters who been through all this um you want to share how you do your taxes and you know, just give our students and even us ones who've been doing it some insight on what you do so anybody can jump in oh i'm gonna start I'll calling go. on people okay i'll <laughs> talk i'll talk so you don't have to call on people okay go ahead Vanessa. <laughs> so it took me a long time to get it figured out because it was not something that was taught in school and I was a very young court reporter starting out. So it was a little rough for the first few years. Um, I think the first year, like I kept receipts and stuff for write-offs, but like nobody told me that, that those maybe should go into like a spreadsheet or be a little more organized. And so I was like scrambling my first year, like trying to put all of my receipts from the year into like something that was like organized. So I have like a spreadsheet of all of my write-offs um, that are really easy. And I have a team of tax people that take care of my state taxes and then my IRS taxes um, to, to help with that. Um, Cause there's just so much in it. I know a lot of people that do it on their own and they're really good at it, but I'm not one of those people. So I'll pay the professionals to do what they're good at. <laughs> But what I do is I set like 10 to 20% aside out of each check that I get and put that into a separate account. And then sometimes I end up giving myself a tax return if all of that money isn't needed. And so that, that part's kind of nice, but it's easier said than done for sure. Good information, Vanessa. Thank you for sharing that. Hi, can you, can you, uh, everyone hear me? I know I'm still in the car traveling. Oh, Karen, wanna, go ahead. It's all yours. Few words, but I want to make sure I'm not choppy. Go ahead, Karen. I can't hear. Gina. Oh, Karen. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, me being an employee and an independent contractor at the same time, um, it's caused a lot of, uh, 
tax questions and just not really knowing at the beginning of my career what to do either. Um, in fact, when I first started out, I had no idea what I was doing. And um, I learned through trial and error uh, that I had taxes to pay and uh, I needed to figure it out quickly. So um, we actually at Journeys of Mentoring are going to be having a financial advisor that actually is my personal financial advisor, but he also uh, teaches at the local uh, community college here in Pacific, uh, Pacifica, California. And he's willing to come on and do some workshops with us about how to uh, be financially uh, secure and stable uh, with your uh, independent contractor status. And also if you are an employee at the same time and how to work that out. Definitely agree with whoever was speaking before. I'm sorry, it's hard on the phone um, that, you know, keeping track of everything, every detail, um, is so important um, because at the end of the year, you want to have all your ducks in the row so that you can um, make sure that you're paying your taxes on time and not get caught up every year, then you fall behind and you're going to have some troubles. Also, just being aware of all the write offs that are available to you every year, you know, tax codes, taxes change laws change and so having someone to be able to go to to find out what's the new uh, policies and you know when you start making pretty good money you you fall into a different bracket too so um, you got to be sure you know uh, what you're up against so it's always good and that's the thing yeah court reporting school doesn't you know even colleges for regular classes don't teach any of that so um, it's good to just have that information available to you. So we're going to have some workshops coming up. So I encourage all of you to check this out because it's just such a great program. Thank you, Karen. That was good information. and I'm looking forward to that. Let's see, we have a question. Um, what are the chances of an audit for an independent contractor? Anybody got an answer for that one? Uh, I was going to say my boyfriend's an accountant and uh, <laughs> some things to, to about auditing, especially because the IRS just got raised uh, funding and they're not there to get the people who have W-4s, but we're 10 to 99 employees and we have the higher chances of being audited, especially if you um, write off your home office, that's a higher chance. And then if you just like, I've seen a lot of court reporters who say they write off their massages, their masseuse, their housekeeper and stuff. Uh, that stuff can get you in a little tricky water, and if they see that, it might trip them up. Colleen, thank you. That was good information. I appreciate you. Anybody else have um, some comments? Me. <laughs> um, Katie, is that you? Where you're? Oh, there you are. Yeah, okay. that's me. Um, I found at one time, I just like went to H&R Block or someone, you know, just a tax person to do my taxes. But I found out that there are people that truly just basically um, center themselves on independent contractors. And that was a better route, a definitely better route to go. They knew all the deductions. They knew, you know, not just court reporting, but independent contractors. So I found that that was a little more helpful than just anybody Joe Blow for myself. Thank you, Katie. Good information. Appreciate that. Anybody else that's been doing this and want to chime in? Uh, Beth, you had said something, I think, was it you? No, it was Vanessa. Was it you, Beth? Did you put something in the chat? Yes, I did. Oh, would you mind sharing with us? Which, which one were you talking about? The taxes? Yes. Did you comment on that? Yeah, I did. I just, um, I opened a separate account. Okay. And I put all my, I deposit every single check I get into there and I pay all my expenses from that account. And then I keep up every single receipt. I mean, every coffee receipt, just so that I have it. I'm just a little nervous about 
an audit if I ever got audited, boy, they, they would be like, this woman has a lot of paper, but I keep every single receipt and I put them in categories and I found an accountant, like Katie said, that um, is an accountant for a lot of independent contractors. And, um, you know, on Facebook, there's a lot of people that go on there and say, oh, you can write off this, you can write off that, you know, take that with a grain of salt. Don't just take their word for it. Ask your accountant. And my accountant also gives me envelopes <laughs> for um, quarterlies. So I never forget. So that was just really nice. Yeah, that's good information. Thank you very much. Thank you for being here too. Thank you for the link. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, let's see, that was the last question that I have on my list. There's a lot more questions. And there's another one, Teresa from Lynn. Okay, Lynn, go ahead. Oh, yeah, Lynn, where are you? Go ahead, Lynn, it's yours. It just says, do you need a business license to be an independent contractor? Oh. I can answer that a little bit. Um, go ahead. You should have a business license um, because as an independent contractor, it's almost like having your own little business. I mean, you can make your own business name, you can, um, or just use your own name, but having a business license um, in your city also gives you benefits um, in the city that you're working as well as a business owner. And you can write off more things when you have a business license. Also think about insurance as well, as far as professional liability insurance or just liability insurance. These are things that um, as an independent contractor, we need to think about um, when we go into our careers. Definitely, and and um, as a as a sole proprietor, you're paying self employment tax versus when you have a business name, um, you're not paying that tax. So, um, you know, definitely you have to you know talk to your your CPA about um, options, but you know, definitely, um, like Karen said, it, it gives you more tax um, breaks, you know. Um, but but as she said, also, the more money you make, the higher tax bracket you get into, right? So you're, you know, you're, you're, um, you're, uh, the, the state of California really, you know, gets you one way or the other, but <laughs> um, you got, you just got to be, you um, you know, prepared. I, I personally have been audited once um, and it was a pain in the ass all the way around. And um, you, um, I think they, you know, it, was, it wasn't stupid things like, you know, like coffee receipts and stuff. It was like big things, right? Like they, you know, I, I don't even remember it was years ago, but um, yeah, it's, it's, it, they just want to make sure you're not writing off like, you know, your, your Lamborghini as a, a business expense and, <laughs> <laughs> you know, that kind of stuff. But um, anyways, yes, the business expense or the uh, business license is good to have. Okay, it looks like Vanessa has her hand up. Yeah, I had a situation a few years ago where um, a company had sent me my 1099 and it was wrong. And I had like all of the paperwork to back up why it was wrong. And so they sent me a corrected one. Well, then they filed both of those 1099s with the IRS and I only filed one. And so oh. I got audited because the IRS was like, hey, you know, you owe on this amount. And it was a big, huge, messy ordeal. And my CPA, who I no longer have anymore, was like, oh, well, you have all the paperwork so you can handle it on your own. And so I ended up having to handle it all on my own with the IRS. And then the IRS wanted me to reach out to the company and get it situated with them. And I said, no, 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 I already did that before my taxes were filed. They messed up, you can reach out to them. This is your deal now, you know, you can take care of it. And like a week later, after I sent in all of my stuff proving that I made what I said I made, I got a letter that my case was closed and I was correct and everything was fine. But just really pay attention to your 1099s and keep a spreadsheet of the money that you're making because people make mistakes and it can get really, really ugly really fast um, when it comes to taxes and stuff. Mm, that's good information. Thank you, Vanessa. Um, 
let me check the check check chat box real quick. Someone, uh, Beth, I have a question about uh, 1099. Go ahead, Beth. Oh, sorry, I was typing it in. Um, this just happened to me last year, so I don't have any experience. So I had already done my taxes and um, someone sent me a 1099 after the fact and it was, you know, they missed the deadline, but what do I do in that case? Does anybody have that happen? So I, I don't think I have an, an, a, an answer for that, but I think if, if you were prepared in, um, you know, in your files, like if you're documenting all of the work that you're doing for other companies, you would have already had that income, you know, um, documented yourself. And then, so you wouldn't even really need that 1099. It's the 1099s are just um, from the company to show how much money you made from them every year. So, um, you know, they, if they send it late, I mean, still, if you, you know, like, like for me, I have a list of the companies that I work for. Um, I document, um, I mean, now I'm using QuickBooks, so it's easy for me to go in and see, you know, who, who, um, who I worked for this year, how much I got paid, you know, um, all that stuff. So if you're really good at, um, documenting that stuff, you would, you should have that, um, the amount documented already from what you made from them the previous year. Um, one thing that, that I do with my independent contractors, um, is I email them the amount that they made from me that year. And I have them confirm that before I send them a 1099 that way, um, them and I are both on the same page before I send that. So, um, I would, I would definitely um, suggest don't, don't rely on the company to, to send that to you or don't rely on them to, to have the right amount. Like Vanessa said, um, keep track of all of that stuff yourself. And that way you don't have to worry about, you know, whether they send you that 1099 or not. Also as, as a business, um, if you were to, to become like an LLC um, or an S corporation, the companies that you're working for don't have to send you a 1099 at that point. It's only as a sole proprietor. So if you are a business um, and you didn't receive a 1099, it's because they don't have to send you one. So don't freak out um, about that. But yeah, as a, as a business, you have to keep track of all of that stuff yourself. So if they send it in late, that's not going to be a trigger to the IRS that wait, there's more money we need to check to make sure she, I mean, I, of course I always include all my money, but yeah. I mean, if, I if you, um, I, I'm not, I'm not a hundred percent sure, but if you, I, I think if, if you documented that money, um, and they just sent it to you late, I don't think it's going to be an issue. It, I think it would be an issue if you didn't claim that money. And then the IRS saw that they, you know, sent you that 1099 later and they're like, well, how come you didn't claim it? Um, so then, you know, then you would have to go back and, and redo your taxes. Um, so, I mean, I can't speak for the IRS, but they, you know, they, they just, I, I would just document all of my stuff, you know, before waiting for the company. So. Thanks for doing uh, April, did you want to chime in? I did, Ruby. That happened to me. I think it was Ruby that was speak who was speaking. Um, two state of California entities never sent me a 1099 ever, and uh, another one. And I emailed them. Of course, I told my accountant and declared the income. But as well, <laughs> another company who is a um, 501c3, which I still have to pay my taxes because they paid me. Um, I had to remind them to send it. So. You know, like Regina said, um, we just got to keep track. And just because they don't send us the 1099, we still have to pay the taxes and we're just covering ourselves. I never did get those two um, 1099s or a check that they owe me. State of California, thank you very much. But anyway, I will get it. Um, good advice. Always report your income. Very good. Thank you, April. Um, Gina from Journeys and Mentoring sent me a, a list of possible questions that uh, their, uh, their uh, members wanted to know. We've covered some of it, but right now, um, Virginia, you know what I'd like to do is open the floor to uh, anybody, actually, especially our students. But before we do that, Claudia, you had a question. 
excuse me, Lydia, you had a question. I can't see. Lydia, you had a question. I think I saw it in the chat. Oh, I, I was just asking because I just have my DBA, which one would you guys recommend as far as um, what's better to get a sole proprietorship or to get an LLC? Because I was told by my accountant that it just depends on the, the amount of money you make during the year. So I don't know if that's correct or. Well, it does, it does depend. Um, and, and definitely you have to talk to them about whether an LLC or an S corporation is better for your situation. Um, sole proprietor is if you're doing business as yourself, right, as your name. Um, so that's where you pay the self-employment tax um, and all of that. But I would, um, you and I can chat more offline about it, but um, um, find a, a CPA that knows the industry, um, you know, and, and has worked with, you know, captioning companies in the past. And I actually have someone, um, that does, so I can share that with you after. Excellent. But as I just wanted to make sure Lydia got her question answered, a lot of you've been participating in the chat box, which is really, uh, good. Uh, and as I was saying, Gina from uh, Journeys and Mentoring has sent me a list of possible questions. But before we, and we've covered some of that, but what I would like to do is open it up to some of you who might want to speak or say something or ask questions um, that didn't get to the chat box. I just want to give you an opportunity to talk. And, um, you know, this is an informal environment. So just go ahead and, you know, raise your hand and we'll pick you and you can share or either ask a question, a burning question that you might have. So it's open to- Our answer. students, where are our students at? Yeah, I think there's quite a few and they're just not talking. Steph? <laughs> Go yes. ahead, Steph. And then Lynn. Steph, where are you? I lost you again. Uh, do you have anything you want to ask or a burning question that didn't get answered? For, well, we're glad you're here. You put us on the spot. No, I don't have anything right now. I mean, I have like no questions and a million questions all at once. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Okay, that's fine. And then I saw Lynn, you're waving at us. Are you a student? Uh, yes, I still am. Um, welcome, I was welcome. wondering, thank you. Um, do you suggest getting like the, um, the like CRC or any kind of like uh, certification from NCRA or does CCRA have any certification at all for captioners? I'm glad you asked. I'm going to chime in real quick. Uh, CCRA does have a certification now, and you can go online and you can sign up. I think there's a test coming up soon. I'm not sure. Well, no, uh, you can sign up to take the test. And even though I'm licensed CSR, I am working on real time uh, certification. I've passed the written, but me and skills, I have to work on that when it comes to test taking. And I'll, that's another story. But anyway, I suggest, I say absolutely. Right, April? <laughs> why not it just empowers you so like regina was saying the rates why not be on that higher end you know why not and show what it's about show what you have to offer it, it, it's not for everyone i've worked with people who are amazing writers and for whatever reason like Teresa was saying the the stress the nerves and um, their writing speaks for themselves but you know um why not try it and um add those initials behind your name did I answer your question, Lynn? Very good. Students anymore? I know some of you who emailed me said you were really excited about this, so we'd love to hear from you. Yes, we had so many people on camera earlier. Come back and join us. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I'll throw one out here. I'll get a conversation started. Um, experiences in remote versus in person. Anybody wanna share your experiences? in remote or in person. Personally, I really, really like doing remote. Yeah, um, I mean, before, you know, before COVID, um, you know, it was remote and online more, um, or sorry, remote and on site, um, more on site and, and everyone went online, right? And we were like, 
we've been trying to tell these clients to go remote forever and then COVID forced them to go remote. Um, so we've been, you know, we've been trying to, to keep the clients remote. Um, a lot of people don't want to go on site, you know, anymore um, for, you know, either safety reasons or, um, or just because they love the remote environment. So um, yeah, but, but with that said, though, I, you know, I, I want to encourage you, though, don't limit yourself. Um, I encourage all of my, my mentees to, to take whatever you can, right? And, and if there's something being offered in person, um, you know, don't, don't reject it just because you don't want to work on site, right? It gives you that experience. It gives you that hands-on training. Um, and it, you know, especially when you're first starting, um, you know, when you, when you, when, when you're a captioner for, you know, five, 10, 15 years, you can be a little more picky choosy about what you take. Um, but in the beginning, don't limit yourself, take everything you can, um, and, and get that, get that experience that so you'll, you'll, you'll thank yourself later. Absolutely. I'd like to chime in on this. Can oh. everyone hear me? Okay. Yes, Karen, go ahead. Um, I work both remotely and on site, and I always encourage our mentees at Journeys to at least try on site uh, CART at least once in their career. In the beginning, like you said, um, is so important because it actually connects you so that when you go back to working remote, you have that connection in your brain of what is going on. If you've already just been working remotely and you haven't had that experience on site, I think it really bridges a gap between like, who am I serving? What is, who, what's going on in the classroom or the event? Um, it gives you a picture in your mind and it really actually, for me, it helps me write better remotely when I know what the situation might be. Like maybe the student's running late to class and you're sitting there remotely going, okay, what's going on? I have no audio, what's happening? You can think of all the things that might happen or occur when you're going on site and you put yourself in the shoes of the consumer and you think of what's happening. So I really think and encourage all of our mentees at least to come. I've, I've asked them to come to California if they can to join me. Um, I'd love to have anyone on site shadow me at De Anza. Um, I know it, you know, for some of us, we have to travel far, but I would love to get something together maybe next year where we can all meet up in person and do some type of um, on site events, uh, like live events, live classes where we can shadow and um, gain that experience because I think it really helps that connection uh, when you're working remotely, it's important. Can I jump in and ask a real quick question? Um, of course, remote, it's harder to hear. And I did um, buy from sound professionals, you know, all the equipment and everything. And I'm just wondering if anybody has had really good luck with certain connect connections or like earphones or, I don't know if it's, I'm just getting older, but it just seems to be getting harder and harder to hear on the remote depositions. Okay. Uh, let's, first of all, uh, Vanessa, did, did you leave your hand up or do you have a comment? Cause I was gonna take them first you, uh, then Yvonne, and then I think April, did you just put your hand up? It looked like you took it down. Oh, it's back up. But I wanted to get Beth's question answered. Anybody have something to contribute? I, I mean, gonna, go ahead. I'm sorry. Was that? No, no, no. Know. Go ahead, April. Well, um, I, I thought you were talking about captioning. So when you said depots, I took my hand down. But just a really quick to piggyback, um, I will be honest. I've obviously done both remote and live. And my preference is, is remote. Um, I'm local, but I'm still doing remote because the professor has the mic right on their lapel. Mm -hmm. And so I hear better in this lab than I do when I'm live. And so, but that's captioning. I know court reporting is different and I do not do remote depots. I don't do depots now at all. I'm too busy, but so I can't speak to that. But um, I'm sure there's always a situation where live is better, obviously, but I have say with the right microphones and setup, uh, remote 
is much better for me to hear. And I can offline, Beth, give you what, um, I can get the name of what we're, uh, they're using at a particular place that I'm captioning for just a couple times a week to help them out. Um, but it's amazing, 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 amazing. And I'm getting older too. So I'm with you, girl. <laughs> Okay, thank you, April, for that. Uh, but Beth had wanted to know about, I think, any uh, really good equipment for, what is it, audio? I think does anybody have anything that they use that um, made it better for them as they did their jobs? Anything different? All right. Um, then maybe think of something later. You can always share an email me and I could get a hold of Beth, okay? Um, Vanessa, did you leave your hand up or did you have a comment? I had a comment, but it's kind of like way off topic now because it was from back when Regina was talking. So I don't know if I should just wait maybe till well, later. This is a former, go ahead. And then it'd be next would be Yvonne. Okay, I can't remember now exactly what it was that Regina said that made me think of... Um, when you're an independent contractor, um, it's really important, in my opinion, to remember that you are an independent contractor. And so you can contract with as many different companies as you want, or maybe just a small amount. When I was a new reporter and started working, the company I worked for made me feel like I couldn't work for anybody else. And being a new reporter and not really understanding what an independent contractor was made it really hard because I was like, well, I think I can work with other companies, but this company is making it sound like if I do that, they're not going to give me any work. And what can happen is that if you only work for one place and something happens with that place, you have nowhere else to get work from and no one knows who you are because you spent all your time just with this one company. So I just wanted to throw it out for students just to make sure they know that when you're an independent contractor, never feel obligated to only have to work for like one or two different companies. You can do whatever you want. Very good. That's good information. Yvonne. Perez. Okay. Um, I'm kind of going backwards too. Regina had said earlier that captioning doesn't pay as much as it used to. And I was wondering if you know like why that is and if you see long term, is there is there anything anybody that's trying to fight to change that at all? Yeah, so so broad it's um, broadcast captioning that the rates have gone lower and it's because we have um, you know the big the big companies coming in and undercutting um, all of the smaller agencies, right? So, um, you know, they're, they're bringing in things like AI, which is a lot cheaper um, than live captioners. So, you know, a lot of stations, for example, um, you know, will say, well, let's go with AI because it's cheaper. Well, then they go with AI and then they realize it's not as good quality. Um, so, so I've seen, you know, broadcast stations um, go back to live captioners because they, they care about the quality. Um, but I've also seen, you know, companies, um, you know, stations or clients that will stay, stick with AI because they don't care about the quality. They just care about saving a penny. Um, so, you know, long term, um, I mean, I've been in this for 16, 17 years now, and I, you know, it was a talk back when I started, I'm sure it was a talk, you know, when April and some of the, the older captioners started um, is in that, you know, they, they keep saying that we're, we're not going to have a job, right? But I, I honestly don't don't think that in the near future, we're going to be out of a job. Um, if you take, for example, um, you know, your, your cell phone, right? You, you use voice to text and you're, you're not, you're, you're texting a, um, you're using your voice to text, you know, someone. And for me, I always have to double check to make sure that it it's correct in what I was saying. Right. And that's me speaking clearly. Um, if you, you know, if you take someone on, you know, a captioning event who has an a thick accent, who, you know, is using dense terminology, that stuff is not going to come out correctly using AI. So yes, AI has got 
has gotten better over time, um, but they are definitely not going to take our jobs um, in the near future. So for all the students um, who are who are wondering about that or worried, well, I don't know if I should get into this because, um, you know, may, maybe our jobs, you know, I, I go through all this schooling and then our jobs are going to get taken from us that I don't, in my opinion, I don't think that's going to happen um, within your um I want to say lifetime, but lifetime as in your career lifetime. Um, I still think it's going to be a long while before AI completely takes us over. So it, a, another thing too, on, on television stations, if you look, um, AI can't do speaker IDs. AI can't do, um, you know, punctuation. So things like that, you know, you're, you're watching AI and it's literally run on sentences. You don't know who started what sentence, where the other one ended, you know, things like that. So it's definitely um, a work in progress, but it, you know, it's captions still need that human touch. So the, the stations that you said that have gone back to um, a live stenographer are, are they paying what they were in the first place after they've dropped there or is that a fight? Um, it's definitely a fight. Um, you, you know, it's, so the, the television station, for example, contracts with the captioning agency. So the captioning agency, um, is the one that has to, you know, negotiate with the client about what rates are, right? And, you know, a lot of people like, like I'm a captioner, but I also own, own a business, right? So I'm on both sides of it. I can see both sides. Um, as a captioner, I want to get paid what I'm worth, right? But then as a business owner, I have to think, well, you know, these clients are asking me to lower my rates. Well, as a business owner, does that mean I have to lower the captioner rate? Does that mean I have to take a cut for myself? How am I supposed to stay in business if I cut my profit, but not the captioner's rate, right? So it's all, um, you know, it, it's, it's a lot. Um, and for me, I'm a small business and I chose to take that cut out of my profit. So I, you know, I have a, a rate set for my captioners and I will not drop lower because I feel like, um, if the captioners are happy, um, the consumers are happy, right? So, so it's just, it's about negotiating, but I've, I've learned, um, throughout the years that, you know, in with clients who say, well, can you lower your rate? Well, we can talk about, you know, maybe if you sign a contract with me long-term and, you know, you guarantee that I'm going to have, you're going to use me as your vendor for a year, then maybe I'll talk about, you know, lowering my rates. But, you know, someone Joe Blow out of the blue is going to, you know, say, hey, I need this event captioned, but um, I only have, you know, I, I don't have a big budget. Well, I'm sorry, you need to go find someone else because I can't do it for that rate, you know? So, it's, it's really, um, it's about the, the negotiation part and, and the bigger companies, they're just like, what can they do for cheaper? Um, whereas, you know, the, the smaller companies really care um, about, you know, the quality and, and, and helping, you know, captioners feel worth, feel their worth, um, and, but having the clients happy too, you know, at the end of the day. So, it really depends on the agency you're working for and things like that. But again, that's where you want to get in with a bunch of different agencies because you have agencies that, that pay less, but they're amazing to work with. Right. But then you have agencies that pay more, but they're like a pain in the ass. So it just like, you have to like get on with all of them and then, and then you can like pick and choose which ones you like to work for and Know, give and take, right? So every every have some that the page rate is higher. Um, you know, they they pay you a higher um, a higher per diem. You know, things like that. So you just have to get on with all the the agencies and then um, and then go from there. But um, Beth, there there is not an, a particular list. I personally comprise the list of agencies myself. I'm happy to share with you or anyone else on this call. Um, but there's, you know, I, I did that. I made the list because there's not a list out there, right? And it's not something that you can just Google either. <clears throat> Excuse me. If you, if you Google like broadcast captioning or cart captioning, you're going to get, um, you know, the big companies like Vitag and Caption Colorado. Um, those, you know, companies are, um, 
you know, they're, they're undercutting all of the, the lower companies, um, to get the clients. And then that's where the, you know, the clients are like, well, this company over here is, you know, giving us captioning for next to nothing. Well, I'm sorry, go back to them then, because you're not going to get that from me. Um, yeah. Thanks, Medina. Um, Shantae has had her hand up and then Steph and then uh, Ruby has a question. So Shantae. So that was my question actually was, um, cause I'm not currently in school. So I was wondering, um, all you ladies keep speaking about these agencies. Is there a list? Does your school provide that list? So that was my question. So I'll get with Regina, um, mm -hmm. yeah, later on. Thank you. Very good, Steph. Thank you. Um, yeah, you. I had a question about software. I thought of a question. <laughs> I have a question about software. So we're already going to be like four or five thousand in the hole for our cat software. And you mentioned that different um, broadcasters or cart wherever have different software. Is that something that you hook into that they control, or do you have to pay for to have that software at your end? And if so, like what's the price range of those softwares? <laughs> what are we looking at when we're already like? 15, 20, 20 grand in. Yeah. So unfortunately, um, to be a broadcast captioner, you need the broadcast version of whatever software you're using. There's no way around it. Um, and I use um, Case Cat and I have the broadcast version of that, which was another $5,000. So um, <laughs> you know, I'm uh, 5,000 in with case, 5,000 with broadcast, you know, 5,000 with my machine. I mean, keep it going, right? We're, we got all these um, things, but that's exactly why you don't lower your rates because you're paying all this money, um, you know, to, to be one of the best, right? Broadcast captioning is um, you have to be fast and accurate at the same time. And, and, and that's not a dig to the other, you know, um, you know uh, industry, you know, depot or court, um, things like that. But, you know, that's one of my friends taught me know your worth, right? And, and when we're putting all of this out there um, to, to build this business, um, you know, it's so easy for the clients to come and say, well, can you give us a discount? Well, I'm sorry, if you go to a grocery store, you can't negotiate the price of milk, you know, like, I mean, you walk in a grocery store and say, well, I'm sorry, I can't afford this, you know, $3 and 50 cent gallon of milk today. Can you negotiate with me? No, that's not how the world works. Um, so you, you, it, it sucks. Yes. But the broadcast captioning is going to open so much, so many doors for you that you didn't know existed. Um, and, 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 I know we're, we're getting ready to wrap up here and I don't, um, I, I could talk hours on, on broadcast, but, but please join my session at the convention. Um, you know, Regina, broadcast you know, we talked about it with our a happy hour, our uh, after yes. party. So if anybody, if you have to go, you know, you're free to go, of course, but if you want to hang on and ask questions and continue to chat for another 30 minutes, that'll be okay. Yeah. Um, and, and just quickly, you know, um, broadcast is not all about television um, um, as far as news. Broadcast is other things like um, um, graduations, right? If you think of um, graduations, we connect to encoders for that. So that's considered broadcast because you need the broadcast software to connect to it. Um, we also do things like, um, you know, uh, um, theater stuff, you know, that's considered broadcast because we use um, encoders for that. So there, there's so, so many things wrapped up within broadcast that a lot of people just get scared of the news stuff. And yes, it's fast because you have reporters who are reading from a script, which first of all, when you read, um, it's a lot faster than just having a normal conversation. Um, so yes, it is very intimidating. Um, and I was intimidated at first as well, um, but it's so much more than that. So I really, um, encourage you to sit out with a broadcast captioner um, and see, you know, on something other than the news. Um, but just, you know, see that it's not all about that. And I think I, I missed a couple of questions in the chat. Yeah, maybe, Ruby, but... uh, Ruby had a question about uh, how fast the caption goes on TV. I think that's what you asked, Ruby. So uh, you are. Yeah, I, are... I see that. Yeah. Um, 
So as far as broadcast captioning, so we caption as fast as they speak, right? So if they're, if they're speaking fast, the captions are obviously going to scroll fast. Um, we, when we connect to an encoder there, we have one second there, there it, I think it's, we have it set to like three seconds, but when you're captioning fast, it's more like one second um, to fix our mistakes before it goes out to the encoder. Um, so if I'm, if I'm in California and I'm captioning a newscast, let's say in New York, um, we get the live audio feed from that station um, and then we caption it and it goes to the encoder um, through the phone line. We, it's actually um, like an old analog line like we used to use um, the dial-up AOL. Um, so it goes out through that um, over to New York, right? And then it goes out or it goes through their encoders out to the TV, to the consumers. Um, so it, it's, it's very... It, so the, the, the way that you can tell live captioning is if the captions are delayed from what they're saying, because we have to hear it, we have to caption it, it has to go through the encoders out to the TV. Um, so people, that's one of the comp complaints about consumers um, or from consumers is, well, it's, it's never in line with what they're saying, right? So they, they might say something and then the captions are like a sentence behind. Well, that's because we have to caption it, right? We have to hear it first and then we have to caption it. Um, if the captions are in line with what they're saying, like if it pops up on the screen before they even say it, that's post-production captioning where they've captioned it already and they've burned in the captions into the video. So that's things like pre-recorded shows, um, you know, talk shows or um, soap operas, things like that. Um, Netflix movies, you know, all of those are pre, um, pre-recorded and pre-captioned. So you can always tell, uh, um, if something is live, if it's, um, delayed. So, you know, I did a job one time where, um, it was for, uh, for older people and, you know, they're, you know, 80, 90 years old and they're, you know, they're reading the captions and, and some little old lady, she was so cute. And she comes up to me, can you slow down? <laughs> and, you know, I slow down like we got to tell the speaker so you know it's just I mean there's just really nothing we can do as you know as far as um how fast the captions are scrolling thanks Regina um we're officially over we're two hours but like I said you want to stay on for another so if you have to go you know you're free to go of course but if you want to stay over and chit chat and ask that burning question that didn't get answered or whatever, you're free to. We'll stay on for another 30 minutes. But as promised, I wanted April to share that experience she had uh, when she captured captioned in Russia. April, can you stay for a few minutes just to share that with us? How that happened? How did you get that job? How was it? Sure. Um, it was in the 90s, um, dare I say, before the internet. Um, so I don't think if we had it now, we'd necessarily uh, do it uh, live. Um, but I, my experience before 14 years ago, if you will, has always been working as a captioner with the universities. So this was um, in Ohio, where I'm originally from. I moved back in the 90s and started captioning and set up a program at my University of Ohio. And we had a, a program that was abroad for the students. And um, one of the students um, wanted to travel to one of our schools that was uh, working with us. And I was hoping it'd be England because that was always at that time a dream of mine to go. And he chose Russia. And this is kind of going to piggyback on fears. Um, I was internally, you know, like taking the CSR, taking these tests, I was afraid to go. And this was before now. I, I just was afraid. I'm not going to lie. And I was praying he'd say England and he said Russia. Now I'm going to move forward and say, um, I went, I actually captioned the class prepping for a semester. Um, this was like 1995 to go to the, to, uh, Russia. Um, I went live. This is when we had the big old bulky equipment and not wheels. It was very heavy since hence the back issues all my life, but, um, a lot of prep. Um, I repacked and packed and packed and was ready to go and went with a professor and a counselor and met in De Gaulle uh, Airport in Paris and was, I went ahead of time 
because it was a dream for me to go to Europe. I didn't have that opportunity up to that point. And then I met up with the class and the consumer I was working with. And we all traveled from De Gaulle, uh, Paris, straight into Russia. And we were in Russia for two weeks, one re- week rather in um, the capital and the other week we went to uh, St. Petersburg. And it was amazing. Um, it was hard, yes. Um, but there are some things, you know, you just have to, I think, I'm sorry, I don't remember who it was, but think on the fly you know, think, okay, um, some things just aren't going to be something you can practice, um, you can study. But I had a list of the words um, when I had it, how it sounded, because we did um, have classes there. (laughs) We actually had Russian classes. So I would hear how it would sound and I would just start pointing so the consumer slash student could see what we were saying. The whole idea was to make this accessible to the best of our ability for the student. also, uh, we went uh, traveled to like warehouses. This was a like number one in the uh, country on business schools. And so I had to orally speak because at that time we didn't have the gadgets we have now to actually travel with a rotating uh, machine, which I have done since then, but not what 1995 when however many years ago that was. So I just orally spoke. I would be stand next to the person who was presenting in these warehouses. Again, business students. So they're showing the difference between Russia and the United States. And I would just orally kind of interpret. I'm not certified, but again, you think on your feet and you do the best you can. And this particular student read lips his whole life. That's how he was hearing in our world. Um, and I was there for what, two weeks. Um, it was an amazing experience. And the only advice I have is face your fears. Um, I was scared to death, didn't show it, kept it inside. And um, I'm so glad I didn't, at that time I was um, supervising, hiring captioners to work at the university and training and that kind of thing. Anyway, I could have assigned it and I was really close to doing that, but my boss said, I want you to go. And praise God, because um, it empowered me that when you think you can't do something, it's all in the head. You have to, you know, face your fears. So it was a great experience. I have to say now with remote, I love remote, love remote, love remote. I have for what, 15 years. Um, I knew there'd be, I didn't know there'd be a COVID. Oh my gosh, but I knew there'd be a need for remote. And um, we probably would never spend that kind of money. It was very expensive, obviously. My, I was on salary at the university. Um, that is a pro for working with universities if your staff, um, I actually retired from the state of California, uh, CSU Sacramento uh, with that. So it's it's a great career opportunity. So now as an independent contractor, I am blessed to have my benefits and also like Regina was saying, 1099. Um, but yeah, it was a wonderful experience and put yourself out there, take a deep breath, reach out to one of us if you have questions and we may have answers and you know what, we may not. This is such a new profession and I can say in my lifetime, we have grown exponentially. It's just crazy. And get involved like this. Join CCRA. Um, I dropped out for many years, to be very honest. And I'm so regretful, but I'm making up for it now. Regina and Teresa and so many other colleagues and friends that have helped me. Um, Try not to go it alone because there's no need to. But with a profession like ours that is growing every day, we're evolving. It's important to kind of reach out and say, hey, I got this opportunity. What did you do? And well, this is what I did. And this is what worked for me. And, you know, we're learning. And as long as, and it's okay to make mistakes. We all do. If someone tells you they don't, they're lying. Um, We all make mistakes, but it's very important to be humble and learn from those mistakes and pass on your knowledge. Don't hold on to it. Pass on to newbies, you know, because uh, in my day, the early 90s, court reporters were very um, secretive, like I have a secret and I know how to do this. And they didn't share. I think that came from a time of fear. But this is a new day. We share the love. We share the information. And so I'm just thrilled to be part of this group. But anyway, that was my little experience um, eons ago in Russia. (laughs) Thank you, April. That's so exciting. Um, As April said, yeah, you know, we want to share the experience. I heard someone say one time that they wouldn't tell anybody where uh, where to find jobs because they were afraid or that someone would take a job from them, which I think is a horrible attitude. That's why we have this group here so that we can share and talk because we're in, we're all in this together. Avon. 
Um, machines. I wanted to ask, I know Regina uses an ergo. I was wondering if any of the other captioners use ergo. And I know it's not something you can really usually ask on Facebook because you don't want to talk about other companies, but is that issue being fixed with the, the ergo company? Are you going to stick with your ergo? Do you prefer it? Anybody else use them? Anybody? Oh, I'm not on, okay. Am I on mute, off mute now? <laughs> um, so quickly for, uh, for our backstory. So yes, I do use an ergonomic machine. I'll show you quickly. Um, if it doesn't rip out. Okay, so this is my machine. And I absolutely love it. Um, so if, if any of you, well, I mean, most of you know, right? If you're writing on a regular machine, your hands are like this and your wrists are turned in. Um, so my ergo machine has two pods. We can spread it all the way out, right? Because your normal posture is where your arms are out and not like this. Um, and so my pods are all the way out and then I can also twist my pods. So if you put up your hands, your normal posture is like this. So that's how I write on my machine, it's like that. Um, so for a short backstory, um, the company that, that made and sold those ergonomic machines has completely ditched all, all of his customers. Um, and so now we are basically, um, in the dark. We can't purchase new machines. We don't have support. Um, we can't get our machines serviced. We can't get parts. Um, so basically we're all in the dark and we're all freaking out because we don't wanna go back to regular machines. Um, so at this point, um, I don't know what we're gonna do. I'm, I'm like working really hard to figure something out. Um, and I don't know what that is yet, but um, in the meantime, I'm just hoping and praying that my machine works and it doesn't break down and <laughs> I don't have any issues. Um, but I will say that I absolutely love it. It has helped me tremendously. Um, I used to wear a wrist brace before I started using it and I have not worn the wrist brace once since I've been using that machine. Um, I, I do get regular massages that was brought up in, um, in the uh, tax um, talk, but for me, it's not about luxury. It's about, an, it's a necessity for real. Um, you know, we sit for long periods of time. This, I have the standing tripod. I also have the standing desk. So um, I have the, the desk where you push a button and it raises. Um, so I try, I don't use it as often as I should, but um, that's, you know, um, another uh, way to, you know, be ergonomically correct. Um, but I, I, I still, I stand behind these machines and I'm trying, that's why I'm trying really hard to figure something out um, because I believe in them that much. You know, I asked, I had a while back, I had emailed Stenograph and then just recently um, Procat asking if they would consider, um, you know, make, making these. And they both said the demand is not out there. It just doesn't seem feasible. But now that that company, you know, the other company isn't, providing the service or anything. I, I think that, you know, I just wish there was a way that, that they would make them because it, yeah, just, I, it makes I, a lot of sense to have just know, that I, option. Yeah. And, and I've, I've reached out to them too. And I don't know why they say that it's not a demand. Um, you know, maybe it's like 1% of, you know, of the industry. I, I don't know. I'm just throwing a number out there, you know, maybe in that, in their mind, they're thinking it's a low, percentage, which it probably is, but hey, those are customers. And, you know, these machines are not cheap, three to five grand each. So um, if these companies are willing to not make them because, you know, oh, we're, you know, you guys are just 1%. Well, that's missed opportunity on them because now our money is going nowhere. Um, so I, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm personally working really hard to figure something out. Um, but yeah, the, the owner has just completely abandoned all of us and it's um it sucks thank you for all your com um your comments um uh, before karen i think gina's left already i wanted karen and gina to tell us a little bit about their um what is it called stadium captioning but before i do that uh, we're going to close at 12 30. do me a favor 
um, email me what you liked about our program, our event here. And to be honest, since this is new, feel free to be honest and say what you didn't care for or make suggestions what the next one, what you would like to see more of. Regina and I were talking yesterday uh, or last night and she suggested like, you know, Teresa, we should do this more often. And we want to, now sometimes we might forgive us if we don't get to it right away, but we'll be working on it because you know, we're all busy and everything, but this means a lot to us. So in other way that we can make it better if we hear from you, don't be sure you won't hurt my feelings, you won't hurt our feelings. Just let us know what you'd like to hear more of. Uh, Karen, real quick, could you just give us some little, um, something about stadium capturing? That sounds huge and intimidating. <laughs> And Regina, if you're, I mean, that's going to be Regina, you're still here, jump in. Hi there. Can you all hear me? Yep. Okay. So, yeah, in stadium captioning, I, oh, back in 2000, I guess it was 2011 when I had the uh, um, opportunity to um, been time friend is actually now the president of San Francisco 49. So through connections, actually, here's where the connections really work. Uh, he, uh, he approached me and asked me if I'd be interested in the county for the 49ers, San Francisco 49 my Karen, you know, unfortunately, you're going in and out, I guess, way. because uh, you're, you're driving. Scared. Yeah, you're okay, going can in you and hear out. me now? We can hear you, but you know how Zoom, sometimes you get the interference, so it's going in and out. So uh, try it again. Let's see what happens. Okay, how about now? Yep, we can hear you now. Try again. Okay, so anyways, um, I actually did a proposal to uh, the CEO of the Niners. I came up with a big presentation. I went down there in person and let me tell you, uh, being present in person when you're selling uh, your captions is key. And um, anyways, I got the job, I got the opportunity and I work remotely since uh, I've been with the 49ers for now nine years. And after being an independent contractor with them for a few years, they, they decided, well, we need to make you an employee. So I have that uh, knowledge of, you know, someone else said earlier in the meeting, you have to be able to uh, work with different agencies. You can't just work with one person or they're going to have to make you an employee. But anyways, <clears throat> I get the audio directly from the uh, PA right on the field. And um, I do all in stadium. So pregame, halftime show, play by play and um, commercials uh, in the stadium. So everything's in the stadium, whether, you know, um, the audience is looking at my captions um, either on the lip of the underneath the big screen or in the concourse, there's TVs all around the concourse in the inside of the stadium and they can see the captions there or they can look at it on their cell phone device. And um, I was just talking to Gina. Gina has been shadowing with me on, on these uh, games and it's just a wonderful experience. At Journeys, we're gonna be doing more of that. Um, it's just, it's actually not that hard. It really isn't. Um, you get a script and I learned how to script through uh, a company called Coast to Coast Captioning. She has the whole scripting program on her inner, on her website. And I took that course and I learned how to script, uh, which is really nice. It gives your hands a break or your voice a break where you can uh, push F11 and it sends the captions out. Um, so if you have, if you haven't heard about scripting, uh, let me know. I'd be happy to share that with you. It's a great experience. And also you're getting play-by-play -play action. And usually when you're hearing it, you're hearing it before the audience or before people on TV. I also have my TV going <clears throat> so that if I miss any names, I can see the TV and the players' names on the back of their jerseys. And then I can plug that in. Um, but yeah, it's just, 
it's an honor to be able to be with the be with an uh, a a a team for so long and be recognized that way. I love, I absolutely love what I do. I wish I could do more of that. Thank you. That was so good. Um, I hope you all have been following the chat. It's been some good information there. We're coming to a close. It's twelve twenty four. Any uh. Well, I like to say, don't forget to um, go on CCRA's website for captioning on a regular basis. And I want to thank everyone who contributed or oh, gave really some good information. I mean, I'm learning from it as well. I hope you were able to make some connections, um, you know, all of that. So um, I, guess we'll, I guess we'll start closing it down. Uh, anybody we got five minutes, 10 minutes? I think we're done. Okay, well, everybody. Teresa, have a Teresa, Teresa, just put your um, your information in the chat and I will do the same. That way, if anyone has any questions after, um, we can definitely connect and, uh, and go from there. So I just want to say thank you for everyone joining. Um, we appreciate you and hopefully you'll um, join us at the convention. And if, if any of you captioners want to get involved with our captioning committee, um, Teresa is the chair of that committee and um, it's, it's fun. We have a lot of fun on that committee. So we always uh, welcome the volunteers. Okay. And like I said, we are recording this. There was one thing I wanted to say. Oh, for you uh, who live in California, somebody with a motorcycle. Um, it was about three months ago, we met at a restaurant, some captioners and I, uh, Regina and I hosted the event and we got a chance to network and it was really fun. It was informal. We had a meal together and we talked about our profession. And as you know, it's so cool to talk with, to be around people who share, share the same passion as you do. So we have another one we're planning on in October. So look for that on social media. So yes. um, check the chat box. Uh, we put our information in there. And we will see you next time. And don't forget to email me with any of your suggestions. And we're we're both um, on social media. So if any of you want to connect with us there, Facebook or Instagram, um, we always, you know, post helpful things there and tips. And, you know, there's lots of groups on Facebook for, for captioners and helpful stuff. So we, um, we're all in this together and you know, students, we need you and, and voice writers, we're going to be one with you soon and um, lots of lots of good stuff happening. So we're, we're fighting, you know, for everyone in this, uh, in this industry to be a whole. So thank you so much. Yes, thank you very much. Have an awesome weekend, everybody. Take care. Bye. Thank you. Bye. -bye.